Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon if you're tuning in from Singapore and good morning if you're tuning in from Europe and all the rest of the world. Good to good to have you on board. Today's webinar is Challenges, Risks and Opportunities for Solar in Southeast Asia. Today I'll be moderating the webinar. I'm Nicola Kopizanin from Solar Plaza and the speaker of today is Rishab Shrestha, solar analyst from Wood Mackenzie Power and Renewables. It will be a very interesting webinar on the control desk. Marco, the Rotler from Soil Plaza 2, helping us out. And let's begin. So just quickly from the agenda, I will introduce what are the topics of today. Then the floor is all to Rishab, who will give us a very, very detailed presentation about what's going on in Southeast Asia at the moment. And then Q&A session and end of the webinar. As always, please take part in the Q&A. It's always very intense. We get great questions. And I'll mention also later for those who are tuning in for the first time, how to address the questions during the webinar. Quickly, uh, quick introduction. Who are we, Sir Plaza? For those who don't know us, our mission is to positively impact the world by accelerating the sustainable energy transition. We do that mainly through events worldwide, as we like to say from Chile to China. We're based in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, uh, established 15 years ago, uh, more than 125 events and in more than 30 countries. So for those who don't know us, great networking platform uh, with events all around the world. Practical note for today, for any technical issues, problems, please feel free to reach out in the chat box. As I mentioned, questions, use the uh, Q&A box. We will address them at the end, uh, so please have those questions coming in. Um, slides, of course, will be available in the end in the hands out, uh, handout sections for those who want to uh, see the material and get an updates. And also, we'll publish the recordings on our website and on our YouTube channel in the end for those who can make it today. Just a brief note. Uh, we are organizing one of our next events in Singapore on October the 31st. Uh, it's called Unlocking Solar Capital Asian Financial Summit. It's part of the Broad Three Days uh, ACES Summit. Um, what are we going there? We are having four great tracks from project development to financing um, and generally covering the Southeast Asian market. So please join, register, uh, visit our website. We'll get uh, get on that more later, and we'll be having our event in the beautiful uh, Marina Bay Sands Convention Center. So for those who want to join and learn more and attend, please feel free. You're more than welcome. But getting back on the topic of today, allow briefly introduce our speaker Rishab. He's a solar analyst at Wood Mackenzie. Uh, he focuses mainly on downstream PV markets in the Asia Pacific region. But as mentioned, we will be covering Southeast Asia specifically during this webinar. Uh, before gain experience as a solar market analyst, May Consulting, uh, and other clean tech startups in UK and India. And nevertheless, Rishab owns a master's degree in sustainable energy futures from the worldwide famous Imperial College in London. And now let's begin. I will uh, leave the stage to Rishab. Rishab, controls are yours. So welcome to the webinar and let's enjoy your presentation. Uh, thank you, Nicola, for the introduction. Um, welcome to everyone. Good morning for people in Europe. Good afternoon for uh, people here in Southeast Asia and the rest of the world. Um, today, I'll briefly talk about the global solar market. Uh, first, just to give an overview of how the solar market is going globally. And then uh, we'll focus more on Southeast Asia on a regional aspect. And then I've here uh, done some spotlights on some key of key markets such as Vietnam, Malaysia, Philippines. Uh, and um, please, like uh, Nicola mentioned, if you do have any questions, please uh, do send that through and we'll try to answer as much as possible at the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, moving on. Um, for those uh, who are not aware of Wood McKinsey, a uh, brief introduction. We provide market intel for uh, for variety of power uh, and power markets and then traditional commodities. Um, Wood McKinsey acquired Make at Green Tech Media 
and after that acquisition, we have more than 500 sector leading analysts uh, and more than 75 just for power and renewables all over the world. Uh, we're here to help uh, clients within this uh, power and renewable sector uh, and much more to, uh, to provide uh, assistance to create value and, and get the value out of this growing industry. So, uh, moving on to the global solar outlook. Uh, we expect 2019 to be a growing, uh, growing market overall on an annual basis, uh, an 18% growth from 100, uh, around 100 gigawatt install last year to 118 or so. Uh, and uh, moving forward up until 2020, we also see a rapid growth. And from then on, we kind of expect a plateauing, stabilizing uh, demand. I think few interesting things that are happening globally is uh, market is diversifying as costs are coming down. More, uh, more markets are opening up. Uh, Europe particularly is interesting where there's 60% growth year on year. Also, another interesting uh, another interesting trend is the the number of gigawatt size market is growing quite uh, rapidly. In last year, the number of market that had one to five gigawatt installation was seven, and by 2024, we expect that to more than double to 18 markets, right? And so what are the key factors behind in, in general in, in growing this uh, drivers, uh, growing this solar installation? We have policy targets that are increasing. We have a lot of auctions that are coming up. We've, we're, we've tracked more than 90 gigawatts of solar by uh, end of second quarter Q2. Middle East is, is uh, a hot uh, part for that. Solar cost competitiveness, particularly with module cost decline, has been uh, very rapid. There's technological innovation with uh, bifacial solar and mono uh, mono modules taking a, a lot of growth. Uh, we heard Google uh, having announced their large corporate procurement. Uh, uh, so IT sector and corporate PPA is also growing, and then. Uh, also, floating solar is uh, is a big uh, market segment that's getting a lot of interest. There was a solar plaza event just recently uh, where Wood McKinsey was also part of that event doing paneling. Uh, also in Southeast Asia where land constraints is an issue, we expect floating solar to be a, a very important part of the solar capacity mix. So of these uh, annual 125 gigawatt installations sort of post 2020, we do expect utility scale solar to dominate and we're expecting about 70% uh, of those utility scale ground mount to be installed. Um, so in some of the kind of challenge that are common across the goal is, is the profitability is, is being uh, sort of degraded as auctions are, are becoming the norm. Um, curtailment issues, you know, Vietnam, Australia are, are sort of having uh, increasing attention because there's a concentration of solar installations. Uh, subsidy delays in traditional feed-in tariff market or payment delays in India, China is, are also some of those challenges uh, within this uh, global solar scape. So uh, let's focus for uh, Southeast Asia solar market, right? And here we have the annual solar outlook uh, for Southeast Asia, and we expect uh, more than a six gigawatt of installation 2019, and then a bit of decline, and then rebounds uh, post 2020 at a 6% CAGR uh, compound annual growth rate through 2024. So we kind of can divide the, the growth or the historical growth trajectory into three parts where uh, first the, the feed-in tariff uh, in Thailand and Philippines were crucial in, in growing those installations uh, to close to a gigawatt or market show. And when the feed-in tariff policy uh, was phased out, we had a, a lull in the in the project installment, and now as as the costs are super uh, as the costs are going quite down, and the Vietnam is is giving a, a very attractive feed-in tariff, uh, we 
we we saw that that in this just last H1 2019, almost five gigawatt being installed. Uh, so this is the second transitionary phase where feed-in tariff is is delivering a lot of solar installations. But post 2021, uh, we expect the gradual auctions to be uh, phased in and subsidies to be phased out. And as this happens, uh, like many where, like in Europe, for instance, we will. We'll likely see a very sustained growth market uh, across uh, 2024 and to the uh, and, and, and later. Um, distributed solar is also an increasingly uh, important uh, solar segment within Southeast Asia. We have um, sort of the, the retail tariff are, are in the range from 70 to uh, 70 to 170 dollars per megawatt hour, Philippines being high, Vietnam also kind of being on the lower side. Uh, a key challenge is, is that most of the power prices here are subsidized, so the, re the distributed solar is uh, slightly slower to take off when you compare that to that of the Western countries where residential costs are, or CNI costs are quite high. Uh, residential costs are high. But having said that, the cost competitiveness for, of distributed solar has reached to a point uh, where PPAs are favorable. So these are, are sort of the key uh, drivers and uh, drivers behind the growth expectation that we uh, forecast. So uh, let's look at uh, Vietnam market in more detail. Here, um, on the left side of the graph, uh, we show the levelized cost of electricity for, uh, for all, the, on, all the technologies uh, given by the respective technology analysts at Wood McKinsey. Uh, at the wind, we have onshore wind, uh, not offshore, and then we have thermal. So when we compare to the, this year's feed-in tariff of 93.5 USD cents per megawatt hour, the LCOE is much lower, 11% lower than the feed-in tariff, and also kind of the reason why the returns, is, sorry, why we're seeing such a crash build uh, in Vietnam. Uh, in a feed-in tariff market, investors are usually thinking about returns and sort of in equity returns, we're seeing developers uh, sort of uh, mention low teens or equity returns. Uh, and they're still targeting to have the same returns for the next round of feed-in tariff. So in the next right graphic, um, we have the levelized cost of electricity for solar uh, on the left uh, section and then the draft feed-in tariff submission. Here the range for the levelized cost of electricity is quite high, primarily dependent on solar insulation, where if you're in the north, which is slightly low, in the south there's much uh, much higher insulation and therefore much lower. But in general, we do see that the, the levelized cost of electricity can reach the, the feed-in tariff that is shown in draft, which is around 70 to around 70, 71 USD per megawatt hour. Just last week, uh, the Ministry of Investment and Trade submitted the draft proposal to the Prime Minister office. Um, Rather than uh, having a tiered feed-in tariff like they were initially suggested, uh, now they are planning for having a single all-nation feed-in tariff for ground mount projects, which is around 70, 71, and then rooftop uh, staying the same at $93.5 uh, per megawatt hour. And these are expected to be remain till 2021. And hence also uh, in our forecast, we expect most of the installation to go to try to target for 2021 because of the cost decline that uh, they can take uh, up until that point. So economics wise, uh, solar remains attractive uh, compared to feed-in tariff, but it's still yet to uh, beat the, the most, uh, most competitive thermal generations. But if we look out to 2030 uh, range in the next 10 years, we expect that that solar will be competitive, like by the LCOE will be 20% lower than the the thermal cheap, the cheapest thermal generation plants, right? 
uh, and therefore, um, you know, Vietnam, like many other uh, Southeast Asian countries, is, is a growing power market that needs a lot of power generation capacity, solar market, a solar plant being able to deliver in a very fast pace offers a lot of opportunity, especially when we see that the cost decline is going to be quite massive. So, so moving forward to the outlook uh, here, the cumulative solar capacity for Vietnam will cross 10 gigawatts by 2020. And this is an explosive growth, right? Particularly because it was less than a few hundred megawatts last year, and now you have uh, crossing 10 gigawatts by 2020. Uh, we see three key drivers. Firstly, feed-in tariff, of course, that has been the major driver for 2019, and we expect there to be same for 2020 and 2021. Um, we're expecting solar auctions to come into place uh, post 2021, uh, although the, the framework and the policy uh, details are yet to be panned out. But uh, uh, with that, we expect a, uh, installation delivering close to a gigawatt uh, per year. And uh, direct PPA is also a very interesting market when we speak to developers. They're expecting that uh, there's a lot of uh, manufacturing companies, warehouse, or a lot of factories in, in Vietnam that uh, pay industrial power prices. And at, at that point, once the regulatory framework allows, once, uh, the, once they start uh, having a streamlined process for enabling corporate PPAs either on-site or off-site, uh, off then we expect that this to be a very big market driving growth uh, to the future. Um, and in terms of the key barriers, we have grid congestion, very well known within Vietnam and also expected, right? There are certain regions where, where uh, plants have been built in a very uh, concentrated locations and we have had instances where 22 solar plants, uh, renewable plants have been affected already. Uh, and we expect, you know, this will put a, a, a dent in, in the revenue and the cash flow and hence affect the returns. So uh, we expect this to be one of the key barriers, but there are, there are grid planning, grid investments that are planned on the government side and as, as as this is like as, as this kind of planning takes slightly more time, but uh, we we believe that the grid congestion sort of problem will gradually phase out, uh, but but it'll still make it'll take time. Uh, profitability, uh, as you all as we all are all aware that whenever there's a transition from a feed-in tariff to a auction regime, uh, especially when there's hyper competition hyper competition and sort of the framework are done correctly, there's a very big interest. And then we see that there'll be, it could potentially be a very hot market driving down returns and costs. So investors might find it difficult uh, to uh, have the, the expected amount of returns they would like. Uh, and uh, in terms of policy risk, uh, what I mean by here is, is you know government target was 850 megawatt by 2020 yet that is already crossed by a huge degree so how vietnam sets up its long term policy uh, sort of uh, target that that's going to be important uh, in sort of letting know in how investors would feel about investing in the country and secondly uh, we have, uh, you know, feed-in tariff uh, also for distributed solar. How how will the rooftop solar market policy framework evolve once feed-in tariff is phased out? Will it move towards net metering or net billing, or sort of will it prioritize self-consumption? That that will kind of have an impact on the growth of the rooftop solar. And also, if we look at direct PPA, right? What would how would the wheeling charges be determined? Uh, what sort of certainty would the investors have? These are sort of a lot of many things that needs to be figured out, uh, particularly when the pilot is being done. So we expect the early 2020s, uh, there to be a lot of adjustments and then sort of uh, studying and then optimizing the policies 
and therefore we see that as a, a barrier for um, solar market growth. But all in all, a very, uh, very growing market and a very massive market within Southeast Asia. Uh, so Vietnam is 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 the, one of the best place for solar investors to be at the moment. Uh, moving on next, uh, so Malaysia. <clears throat> so Malaysia, uh, we had uh, the the auction bid prices, the third auction bid prices just released uh, earlier this year, and the prices dropped by a uh, 34% compared to the last auction. And this is significant decline because you know it's double, it's more than double the the price decline that was observed between first and second, and with this price decline. If you look at compare it with the other conventional generation, it's only 12% lower uh, than the coal. Uh, so why why is there this kind of decline, right? And then our assumptions are that, I mean, solar tender is is a very low barriers to entry market, and it is very hyper competitive, uh, particularly if we look at the volume uh, that was subscribed to in this tender option. So on the left side of the, of the graph, we have the solar auction volume that was intended in each of these auction. Uh, 500 megawatt of uh, solar capacity was intended uh, for auction by government. But uh, you can see that uh, more than double was uh, subscribed on the first two auctions, right? But uh, they were only awarded for around 500 uh, megawatt. And But in this latest auction, we're seeing uh, a 6.6, 6.7 gigawatts of, of subscription. That's an increase of more than 300%, almost close to 400% of uh, of, uh, of interest subscription in this tender. And uh, there's few uh, reasons for this. One is uh, one, one is that the auction capacity uh, auction capacity limitation has been extended from 30 megawatt to uh, 30 megawatt to 100 megawatts uh, in this last round of auctions. And also we've seen a lot of interest from foreign investors uh, as well. And uh, what we also hear is that the, the, the returns on the oil palm, palm business in, within Malaysia is also uh, perhaps not doing so well. There's a lot of new market entry who are traditionally not, who are traditionally not in the solar business, also participating, wanting to get this uh, this uh, grab of a pie, and that's why we're kind of seeing this huge, massive jump in solar uh, projects. And this also is also partly the reason why we're seeing so much reduction in cost. So here on the latest, uh, on the right side, we have the auction bid prices, uh, where in the first one, it was more like 110, and the second, the average bid price were 96, and now we have around 63 or so. <clears throat> there are two outliers, uh, which is more than 130, and one is very close to 40, but average price is around mid 60s, or slightly lower capacity weighted average 60s. What is impressive here is that the first two, uh, first three lower prices is almost covers around three, 350 megawatt of projects. So, uh, so with this price competitiveness, uh, we think that you know the government might be incentivized or favored to actually um, plan for more solar in their outlook. Uh, and therefore, uh, we see a very healthy level of growth uh, from Malaysian solar market. So <clears throat> here, um, we expect the cumulative PV capacity to pass the 5 gigawatt DC mark by 2024. Um, unlike Vietnam, where it's very lumpy, uh, because uh, Malaysia has a more scheduled tender, we think that's very good for the industry and also uh, sort of a stable gradual growth. Uh, and uh, the key drivers are, are solar auctions. Uh, possibly there will be new ones. The government's currently under discussion um, and there could be an upside risk here as well. Uh, net metering is also a, a, a important driver from Malaysia. 
Uh, starting this year, uh, they have changed the net metering rules to allow for one-to-one -one compensation. What I mean by that is uh, solar that is exported uh, into the grid is paid as the retail tariff uh, in contrast to uh, in contrast to being compensated by a wholesale tariff for average generation costs. So the economics are, are sort of getting there. Uh, we expect, you know, uh, DG power, especially once costs comes down uh, or during early 2020s to kind of pick up and take off. Uh, so that's also a very interesting uh, uh, market segment in Malaysia. Um, two, two barriers here, one on the grid congestion side and one on the profitability side. Um, if those, a lot of projects are to sort of being procured like many other places, uh, we do expect that, you know, having six gigawatts of, of solar uh, or five gigawatts of solar in certain perhaps peninsular Malaysia could affect those uh, grid and then without grid uh, investments, uh, which, which the government is doing, uh, there might be some curtailment issues or just uh, difficult in handling a large increase in, in, in renewable penetration. Um, profitability. So like, uh, like, for instance, in India or, or many other places where we've seen auctions being hyper competitive, when we're seeing such a large degree of interest, 6.7 gigawatts for 500 megawatt projects, then uh, we're kind of likely to see um, perhaps a market entry bid or uh, or just people cutting on, on their margins to, uh, to make sure that they win the projects. And uh, that perhaps could be a concern for some of the investors uh, uh, and therefore profitability could be an issue. Uh, moving forward if, if the auctions are are going to be hyper competitive. <clears throat> so um, now moving on, um, we have uh, another market, uh, Philippines. Um, here we also provide an outlook and we are also seeing a gradual to stable uh, installation from sort of more than 200 megawatt slightly towards of more than 400, closing on 500 gigawatt, sorry, 500 megawatt in the next uh, five years. Um, here, uh, after the feed-in tariff uh, policy has been phased out, uh, Philippines is in a transition phase where they're working a lot on trying to put the various new policies, RPS together. Uh, and these new policies are, are the key drivers, of course. Uh, the first one being renewable portfolio standards, where they, where they, where it mandates all the utilities uh, and the DUs uh, distribution utilities to procure a certain amount of power through renewables. And the aspirational target is 35 percent by uh, 2035, uh, and uh, they want to increase at the minimum increment of one percent every year. So. Uh, we believe that uh, the RPS will start becoming a driver in 2020. That's when it starts. And also once the cost uh, declines, uh, RPS as solar would be the preferred, uh, one, one of the very competitive renewable technology uh, for uh, utilities to procure for fulfilling that uh, renewable target. A green energy option is also a very attractive uh, market uh, attractive policy where it basically means that uh, end users who are large end users have an option to procure supply from re renewable energy uh, producers and uh, this will again uh, enable uh, enable growth in direct PPAs and solar uh, power plant PPAs and this is also a very attractive segment uh, as as in the west we're seeing a net metering focusing on residential solar, uh, like in, in Philippines, like I mentioned earlier, the, the cost is retail costs are fairly high compared to rest of the Southeast Asia. So and this is a good step 
uh, for solar, uh, DG solar market, although the policy framework is not as attractive as in Malaysia where there's one-to-one, -one, since Philippines export tariff is compensated at 65% uh, so of the genteel tariff. So, uh, but, but these are, we see as the key drivers for growth in Philippines. Um, and in terms of key barriers, uh, we have land acquisition similar to Southeast Asia being fragmented, having to go run through owners, uh, compiling them, uh, sort of combining them is an issue. Um, economics uh, until sort of, sort of without a proper procurement framework, especially in this transitional area, solar is still uh, not yet to be competitive against say thermal or, or other generation but we have seen projects that have signed PSA power supply agreement for uh, 58 dollar per megawatt hour uh, but uh, also believe that they do rely some level on the wholesale market prices uh, but policy implementation is 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 another key barrier I think these all new policies are great uh, I mean, Philippines is the first in Southeast Asia to be adopting RPS. Uh, so we believe they will take some time uh, to streamline all this pro approval and policy process. And hence, uh, uh, that's a key barrier in itself. And then once uh, the country starts uh, sort of becoming more uh, familiar with this, we believe that, uh, that the policies will drive growth. So um, moving on, we have um, here uh, Indonesia. I think Indonesia and Vietnam um, sort of account for one of the largest power demand growth within Southeast Asia. So in terms of a power market, it is very uh, huge and, and, and should be offering potential, but the policy framework is, is quite dim. And the policy target is quite unambitious. So uh, Indonesia is, is not a very interesting uh, solar market yet. Uh, the, the, the National Electricity Plan sort of procurement plan uh, for this year, released earlier this year in February, has actually reduced the 10-year solar capacity by 13%. Uh, in the previous plan, they've mentioned more than one gigawatt could be procured uh, and now it's less than uh, one gigawatt project. And as you can see, the, the kind of uh, procurement plan is, is reducing on the, on the later half, but sort of perhaps increasing in 2020, uh, sorry, uh, reducing pretty much all except in 2023. Uh, so the, Tariff framework in in Indonesia is is um, so is it's a bit complicated in a way that if the the regional cost of uh, generation is greater than the national average, then the renewables will be paid 85% of the regional cost of generation. But if the regional cost of generation is less than the national average then there would be a mutual agreement between the state utility PLN and the IPP. And in terms of economics, uh, the utility scale solar LCOE we calculate is more than 100 USD per megawatt hour, but the average generation cost is around 76. But it does vary between 6 and 17. So there are spaces where we do see solar viable, uh, particularly uh, in replacing uh, micro in replacing diesel fuel or, or sort of uh, having a microgrid area or off-grid area that is quite attractive. But in general, without a policy proper pro procurement framework, we don't think this uh, framework is sufficiently attractive to drive uh, growth, right? Here we're t sort of, if you look at, if you compare other kind of other Southeast Asian countries, they're reaching more than five gigawatts in the next five year, more than 10 gigawatts in the next five year. Uh, here, uh, the Indonesian target is, is less than a gigawatt in the next 10 year, which is highly unambitious. Uh, but 
but the ministry also has said that, however, if there is any plans, any renewable plant that is outside of this plan that are willing to participate, uh, are willing to connect to the grid, then there is a possibility that uh, they will they will adopt that in the next year procurement plan. So kind of saying there is more scope for renewable capacity um, aside from this plan. And in terms of um, moving to rooftop solar market, also like Philippines, also like uh, most other mature rooftop market, the export tariff is is less than the retail tariff. And for a market that is barely uh, more than a few hundred megawatts, uh, this is not sufficiently attractive. Right? If we have the, here I've shown the power price for residential, commercial, and industrial, and it's between 80 and 90. Right? Utility scale solar is greater than 100, uh, and uh, DG solar LCOE would be much higher because of less economic of scale, of capacity, and hence the solar rooftop also is is the economics is quite hard to justify at this moment but of course as cost comes down it will be an attractive market but uh, the economics are not there yet um, so these are the three markets uh, that i've highlighted uh, four markets sorry i've highlighted um, just want to also mention that you know Thailand is is also a very interesting market in terms of uh, rooftop solar at the moment. With the new PDP announced, uh, they're targeting 10 gigawatts of solar capacity, uh, and they try they plan to procure at least 100 megawatt of solar capacity every year. Uh, they're focusing on residential solar, and in the past. Uh, they have not, uh, they didn't allow export tariff, but this year they're allowing, uh, they're having export tariff on 1.68 THP Thai baht per kilowatt hour, uh, which we see as, as a economical, uh, pro which as economic makes sense in this. Aside from this, uh, you know, like in Philippines and Thailand, sort of malls, uh, and factories and warehouse having corporate PPAs with DG Solar is already uh, is already a growing industry within this market. So um, that that is my presentation. Um, I'll pass on to you, Nicola. I and then you can ask me any questions uh, or whatever uh, the panelists have uh, mentioned. Thank you, Rishab, very much. I think personally, it was a very, very clear and great presentation. We have indeed uh, some questions, which our attendees have, and I would like to start uh, actually attaching to um, one of the last uh, topics you mentioned. So uh, you were covering Thailand, and of yes. course you cover, you mentioned briefly the um, situation of rooftops, and one of our attendees is coming up and, and saying basically that of course, we during the presentation we covered especially ground-mounted PV systems. But correctly yeah. pointing out, if we, for example, look at Thailand and we see the latest power development plan, there's actually a big focus on PV rooftops there. So what our attendee yes. is asking is, how if you can possibly expand on the economics of rooftops? Maybe let's fo let's for example look at what our where how how's their application in self consumption and virtual power plants? How how could you how could you expand on that, Rishab? Okay, I mean uh, so so firstly, I think on the you uh, on the policy side, right? Before I go to economics, there's definitely a focus on uh, DG solar in this latest PDP uh, with the procurement of at least 100 megawatt per year. Right, and that is 10 gigawatt. But uh, we should also not forget that they've also mentioned a lot of floating solar plants. Uh, I think it's more than two and a half gigawatts of floating solar plants that is coming online in, in uh, you know, across this year, next decade, up until 2030. So that's also a focus. But one of the reason why DG Solar is a focus is because the economics for Thailand makes sense. And then sort of when we've done, when we've looked at the retail rates uh, 
over there, like I mentioned, most of the Southeast Asia retail rates are around $80 per megawatt hour uh, to, to say 100, uh, Thailand's around 100. Um, and then sort of when, when, what we've modeled is if we look at perhaps uh, three kilowatt, 300 kilowatt projects, um, 300 kilowatt projects uh, in, in Thailand, we had a, a LCOE of, of around 110, assuming around 75% uh, 75 self-consumption in 2018. Um, and so when we look at this 2019, I think uh, sort of we need to, I need to run the model again, but based on the cost declines that we're seeing, definitely uh, can provide, uh, go under this $100 uh, per megawatt hour, that's the retail rate. Um, so uh, is that is that the answer? Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think that <laughs> there's a lot of appetite appetite here from uh, from our attendees on Thailand. Uh, I see. Uh, of course, yeah. big market. We we should actually have probably a webinar specifically uh, on Thailand. But uh, moving on, uh, more technical question, uh, Rishab, that, that yeah. that's coming up. Uh, let's talk about uh, transmission networks or transmission grids, as you want to find them. So, uh, question coming yeah. up is: um, so we look at Southeast Asia, and of course, they're being set up to to actually to uh, to handle a transition from fossil fuel to all type of renewable uh, generation. So, question yeah. coming up is: how are they exactly? being set up how are the networks how are these grids being set up in southeast asia to actually accelerate this transition to a renewable uh, generation um so th that's a very good question and very timely question so uh, thank you for that uh, so firstly i think the familiarity of uh, you know southeast asian countries to deal with renewables is not so high compared to the western part so in that sense there is still a lot of uh, you know getting used to get knowledge sharing with with those particularly european countries that have had those experience so in all these things there's a lot of uh, dispatch centers uh, sort of saying uh, you know we won't be able to uh, handle these kind of things this kind of high level of penetration and therefore the dispatch center is 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 requesting sort of the ministries of, of power and development to uh, either readjust their expectations on on solar uh, policy framework or increase investment in such right and then this whole process is a very time consuming manner uh, given that uh, renewables are coming online so quickly so I, I would say the the planning for TND investment has kind of been traditionally been the same but now that renewables are coming in the the speed needs to be increased much more and these are being paid attention with the help of lots of foreign um, foreign players with which with their power network dispatch to get this uh, investments there and and on on the second point on that is that there has been some uh, focus on sort of there has been you know some push and pull on whether we should uh, have a grid tiered different tiered economics or tiered policy frameworks uh, is should there be a focus on on certain regions so that we can increase the solar um, solar or wind or renewables capacity in this area and then transmit it to that. So I think there's also that part of uh, the investments that's happening where there's trying to prioritize region. Um, and lastly, I think uh, there's also uh, optimization uh, studies being held on, on how do we connect the resource rich area to the load center areas uh, and uh, obviously this will take time to materialize um, and one last point on that is sort of Indonesia again kind of have reduced their investment uh, in in the network and TND investment based on their 
RUPTL that I've shown investment, and also that also affects how uh, how much renewable can penetrate in the grid in the future. Great, Rishabh. And let's maybe shift a bit the focus uh, now a bit on the cost side. Uh, Nat and is pointing out correctly that if you look at uh, the levelized cost of electricity right now, you don't have actually those TND costs priced in at the moment. So specifically, yeah. when you when you look at those two markets such as Vietnam and Malaysia, right? Let's say what's the yeah. range or what's the impact on the percentage or also in nominal terms on final costs? How, how do they actually come and what's their final impact on, on, on the final cost to the consumers? Okay. Again, that's also a great question in a way that you know how do we uh, how do we factor in the grid investment cost that comes into play uh, in LCOE, right? A uh, couple of points on that. First, firstly, um, you know, uh, in Malaysia at least it's take or pay. So uh, there is a take or pay, meaning that if you if for some reason the grid cannot uh, take the invest can cannot take the power, then the the grid will have to pay that uh, to the developer. So in the in a in the contractual terms, the developers are being compensated uh, even for the grid. But I guess your question is how much more would the LCOE be if the grid investment were taken into account? Yeah, definitely. When we have, exactly. How how would you quantify that yeah. actually in a, in a cost basis? So when we've seen uh, when I've done LCOE modeling, we've seen the capex one percent increase in capex to be uh, equivalent one uh, percent increase in LCOE. So it's kind of that kind of range, right? Uh, so we, that is what the range we would expect uh, to be. But uh, now the question is, how much is the interconnection cost as part of the capex? We don't. Uh, I don't have that data for Southeast Asia specifically, um, but uh, that is something that perhaps I can look into and then get back to you. But uh, depending on the share of the cost of the capex, uh, let's say if it's a dollar or it's actually lower than dollar here, dollar per watt. If, if uh, yeah, then we'll probably need to calculate, but the capex is one percent to one percent for LCO. Yeah, I, th I think we, we definitely, of course, for exact numbers, uh, perfectly understand, yeah. and I hope also at and these understand. We have to people investigate a bit that more, but at least we have a, a framework or um, or a range. Very interesting uh, question coming up uh, regarding the floating solar. Um, in the Philippines, just uh, on a side note, as you mentioned uh, at the beginning of, of the webinar, yeah. Rishab, we had a, a solar plus event actually in Amsterdam last Friday, on, specifically on floating yeah. solar. It's a very hot topic and it seems like everybody wants to wants to come on board in this right now. So let's look at the Philippines. Where do we stand right now and where can we expect to be with floating solar in the next years? Okay. Um, so we actually produced a report just uh, recently about floating solar and then ASEAN and Southeast Asia and sort of Asia Pac is, is a leading region within within this market. I think uh, average in annual installations around 1.6, uh, 1.8 to slightly more than 2 gigawatt of expectation um, on the next five years and uh, APAC uh, I think should be quite significant in that. And I mean, key drivers, right? Southeast Asia, land constraints becoming an issue, uh, also East Asia. Uh, and that's why we see that floating solar to be quite uh, significant. Same case with Netherlands. Netherlands has uh, land constraints. Floating solar is, is a prospect, uh, good uh, prospect. And in terms of specific markets, I think uh, South Korea has a big plan. They have a 2.1 gigawatt of uh, of uh, renewable power plant where mostly it's going to be floating solar. And uh, we see that South Korea is going to take the lead. India also has a 10 gigawatt uh, plan uh, for floating solar and they're doing a lot of procurement. 
China also they've had a lot lot of large projects being installed. And uh, Thailand, as I mentioned, uh, they have identified two and a half gigawatts of uh, solar floating solar capacity in various reservoirs. Right? I think the interesting component within the floating solar is how can it complement the hydro dams so that uh, in Southeast Asia, particularly where river water are, are sort of seasonal, so if you could sort of uh, offset the use of hydro with floating solar and save the water to use during the dry season, I think that is a, a good potential uh, prospect, right? And uh, specifically in Vietnam, we're seeing investors from Norway, Skatec Solar, or sort of South Korean doing studies on various lakes and reservoirs to be able to do that. Um, and then uh, I'm also currently in Vietnam and doing a panel on floating solar. And then we, I, like if you have more questions, perhaps I can get back to you after this week, uh, after learning more. Sure. Thank you, Rishab. And uh, let's maybe switch a bit of focus on some smaller markets right now, because uh, of course we've been touching about uh, big numbers and everything, but let's, let's maybe, if you see Myanmar, if you see Laos, if you see Cambodia, uh, how do we stand on that in your opinion? Um, yeah, I think, again, uh, Cambodia, I think, is very interesting, specifically, uh, okay, just a step back, right? I think a lot of the large market had the opportunity to subsidize the solar project, use feed-in tariff, and then go towards auction, right? So these emerging markets perhaps uh, might directly move towards auction and directly have a very competitive tariff, especially in the look in in the context of power growth uh, that is needed in this context. So Cambodia, as such, uh, this year we've had uh, a, a lower cost than Malaysia in terms of bid price. I think it was around 39 USD per megawatt hour. So this policy dynamic and policy regulatory framework, I think we expect that there will be a very competitive you know, around 50 megawatt, 60 megawatt kind of project uh, coming online in the next few years on a sort of a annual basis once the policy takes together. But we think that the role of uh, development banks such as World Bank and ADB will be quite crucial within this. So the scope of large scale solar is there, which will be competitive but uh, they'll need to be assisted much more in land acquisition and TND, uh, TND in interconnection cost. So once the, if these two are provided, then we can see outcome like Cambodia. And on the other market segment side of rooftop solar, I think uh, on a commercial basis, it might be difficult because the power prices are subsidized and perhaps the propensity to pay or the ability to pay is not as much. Uh, so more on the microgrid side or an off-grid side, I think these are a potential market, uh, particularly uh, for these kind of applications. Sure, sure, sure. Of course, uh, for attendees, we have a lot of questions coming in. We fortunately won't be able to take all of them. Uh, so they're very specific country per country, but I want to I want to end up wrap up the Q and A session with a very direct question, Rishab. Of course, we've seen the projections yeah. for the upcoming years in Southeast Asia, but if you had yeah. to give me a number, so we do the webinar in the next, let's say, in <laughs> five years from now, where do we stand yeah. in Southeast Asia? What number do you expect to hit, or maybe country by country, or just region, regional <laughs> wise? Where would we stand? Um, so, I think uh, first that, that's also a very difficult part of forecasting, right? The policy is is changing uh, day by day or month by month. The framework is changing. The cost is going down, so it's it's trying to fix in all these things. But I, I think uh, I'm quite optimistic about Southeast Asia, particularly with the bid prices we're seeing and the generally lower RE penetration in the grid in this region. So uh, we're expecting perhaps seven, five, six gigawatt now, 
uh, I think on the upside risk, there could be several more, three, four gigawatts more on the, on the mid 2020s range. And then the, I hope once all the policies are in fact sort of streamlined and most people are adopting, so an upside risk of uh, four or five gigawatts. Uh, I, I know it's a di very difficult call to make, but I always like to challenge also meet our speakers with uh, with, with some forecasts. Well, needless to say, yeah. as I mentioned earlier, um, <clears throat> won't be able to take all the questions, but since we are very optimistic too, just as a small reminder, Risha will also take part at our event, the Lockheed Capital Asian Financial Summit, once again, October the 31st in Singapore. Lots of sessions, lots of networking opportunities. We also value Q&A time. So if you plan to attend, of course, you can address this, uh, these questions directly to Rishab or to other speakers. So more than more than happy if you join. And I mentioned we have a beautiful venue in the Marina Bay Sands, worldwide famous. So so hope to see you there. Um, Rishab, once again, thank you very much for your presentation, thank for you. taking the questions. I personally think we, we we covered a lot of topics a lot of markets uh, in one hour that's quite a quite a thing so we shop from 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 our side thank you again for joining for sharing uh, for sharing this beautiful presentation thank you um, yeah thank you and one last word uh, like Nicola you mentioned if you are in Singapore and wondering about this market uh, feel free to drop an email which is attached my email is attached in the presentation happy to meet up at the event or uh, have a discussion on solar markets. Exactly. And don't forget to reach also me personally. Email was right there above for the program and for involvement. Rishab, thanks again. And uh, at this point, see you in Singapore. And thanks again for RNTs for joining. The handout, the slides will be available in the handout section. The recordings will be available once again on our website and on our YouTube channel if you want to revise them and double check again. Thanks again. Have a very pleasant afternoon for those joining us from Singapore and Asian region and great day for those joining us from Europe. Once again, all the best from Sir Plaza.